Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my third week teaching on the believer's authority, and I tell you, we have covered a lot of material. You know, uh, most people do not understand how authority works. They don't understand how God uh, respects the power and the authority that He's given us, and He will not do what He gave us power and authority to do. And because of this, people just throw prayers out at God and think if God wanted to, God could heal me, set me free, He could change this person, they could be saved. And if they don't see the right results, they just take offense at God. And they don't understand that God will not do what He told us to do, what He gave us the power and the authority to do. That's just a major, major point, and I am constantly amazed how people just don't understand this. They think God could just do whatever. No, God gave laws and rules, and when God tells us that you have power to do this, now you do it, He won't do it for us. And so you can beg Him and plead with Him all you want, but it's not going to come to pass. I was using on my program yesterday, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, where Jesus was telling his disciples how he cursed the fig tree and how he was able to die, and they were shocked at this. And he says, have faith in God. And then he tells them how faith works. He says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now, there's a lot in that verse, and I've, I've got actually many different teachings on this. I've incorporated this into a lot of my different teachings because it applies in so many ways. So I haven't expounded on this near as much as I could. But in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. One of the ways that you release the power of God is through words. God created the worlds by speaking them into existence. And when he was telling his disciples how he cursed this fig tree and it died, he said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Three times he emphasizes words and talks about how important they are. So if you are going to operate in the power of God, one of the ways you release that power and authority is by words. And I specifically was emphasizing that it's important who you speak to also. He said, whosoever shall say to this mountain. Most Christians talk to God about their mountain or their problem, their sickness, their poverty, their disease. But the Lord told us to speak to the problem, not speak to God about your problem. You know, let me give this example again. I've, I'm sure that I've used this. Of course, not every person watches every day, and even if you've heard this, uh, it's just a classic example, and it illustrates what I'm talking about so well. That I have a DVD that shows Nikki Oshinsky being miraculously healed. And I was in Charlotte one year. I was staying at some people's house. The woman watched this uh, testimony about Nikki being healed, and she was just, when I came home, she was actually sitting there with tears in her eyes just saying that was powerful and that she had a friend with the same problem and that this friend was coming over to get prayer. So this friend came in, it's a long story, but she had had this sickness for seven or nine years, something like that. The doctor said that on a scale of one to 10, her pain was a constant 11. They had actually said that she would not live through the year and that was two or three years before, so she was already living on borrowed time. And the only way she was able to cope with this severe pain, besides pain pills and all of those things, she had magnets strapped to her body, and then she had magnets in a blanket, and she would wrap herself in this, and somehow those magnetic fields lessened the pain. And anyway, she was basically uh, just, you know, homebound. She couldn't do hardly anything. And this was a severe, severe problem. So anyway, I talked to her. It's a long story, but I talked to her for 20, 30 minutes, countered some things where she thought that God was the one who put this sickness on her, that God was getting glory out of her being sick. I countered all of those things. I got her to a place to where she believed that God wanted her well right then. I prayed with her and rebuked this pain and this burning, and instantly it left. The woman stood up, moved around, 
and for the first time in seven or nine years, whatever it was, she was instantly pain-free. But then I began to take these exact verses from Mark chapter 11, verse 23, and I said, now here's how you walk in this healing. And if you ever have another pain, it doesn't mean that you weren't healed. It's just like a knock on the door. It's the devil hitting you with a little bit of pain to see how you'll respond. And if you respond by saying, oh, no, I wasn't healed, or oh, no, I've lost my healing, well, either of those responses is opening the door and letting that sickness back in. But I said, if you'll do what I did and just speak to it and take your authority, then this pain will just go right on. It's like keeping the door shut. And he may knock a time or two, but you keep the door shut and he'll leave. And so I took these exact verses from Mark chapter 11, verse 23, and taught her to speak directly to the problem. Don't talk to God about your problem, but talk to the problem. So I taught her all that. It's been about 20 minutes. Anyway, we, you know, uh, she thanked me and we hugged and she was on her way out the door. And as she put her hand on the doorknob, she stopped and turned around and she says, the burning is back. And I said, well, I've taught you now what to do. This is a knock on the door. And I want you to pray and I'll agree with you. So I joined hands with her. And this woman prayed, and you got to remember that just 45 minutes before this, this woman was Presbyterian, and she believed that God wanted her sick. She was praying for health, and yet she believed it was God's will for her to be sick, that God was getting glory out of it. She, and I'd countered a lot of things. And so she prayed a prayer that was an awesome prayer for a person who just a few minutes before hadn't believed in any of this stuff. She prayed a great prayer, and this is nearly word for word what she said. She said, Father, I thank you that it is your will for me to be well. By your stripes I was healed, and if I was healed, I am healed. I claim my healing in Jesus' name. By your stripes I am healed. She said something nearly exactly like that. You know, those are all good things, and those were certain improvements over what she had believed a short time before, but that isn't what God told us to do. And so I knew that that wasn't the instruction that God gave. So I looked at her and I said, so, do you still have the burning? She says, yes, I've got this burning. Why didn't it leave? And I said, you didn't do what the Bible tells you to do. And she says, well, what am I supposed to do? And I said, I just taught you. You are supposed to speak to the mountain. Don't talk to God. I said, everything you said was good, but it was talking to God about what you believe and about your faith in him. Those things are good, and they may edify you and build you up, but you did not take your authority and speak to that burning and command it to leave. And she looked at me, and she says, you mean I'm supposed to say burning in the name of Jesus? And I said, yes. She says, I'll do it. So we joined hands again. She prayed and said, burning in the name of Jesus. And that's as far as she got. And she says, it's gone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that she had a few things come against her uh, over the years since that. That's probably been, I don't know, eight years or something. But I see her every once in a while, and she's never had that problem. I mean, she's had a pain, and she'll rebuke it, and it's gone. She's walked free of that. And it's one of the most classic examples that I've ever witnessed of how you have to speak to the problem. She prayed a great prayer as far as what she believed, but it didn't talk to the problem. See, you have to take your authority instead of asking God to do it, praise Him that He's done it. Now take your authority, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and speak and command that to come to pass. Here's the way that I apply this in my life. You know, I have pains. I have little things come against me the same as anybody else. And here's the way that I pray. I start off, and I, you don't even have to do it exactly the way I'm doing it, but this is the way I do it, and I'll tell you why I do these things. I start off by just saying, Father, thank you that by your stripes I am healed. I was healed, and if I was, I am that I don't have to beg you and plead with you that you have put the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead inside of me, Ephesians 1, 19. And I'll just praise him for that. And I'll say those things to remind myself and to build my own faith. It builds me up to know that I have the power and the authority. And then I'll, I'll not only praise him that he's given me this power, but I'll turn over to Proverbs 18, 21. And I'll say, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I not only have this power 
but I have the authority to release this power. And one of the ways I do that are through my words. And so I'll start speaking. Like if I have pain, I'll say, pain in the name of Jesus. I command you to leave my body, and I will talk to the problem, to the mountain, based on Mark 11:23. And I'll speak and command those things to be gone. And I'll go to the root of it, like Mark chapter 11, where he spoke, and the fig tree dried from the roots up. And I'll say, if there's something in my body that's causing this pain, I'll curse it at its root and command whatever it is to be gone. See, and I speak forth my faith, and then I'll go beyond just releasing death towards what's wrong, and I'll speak life into my body. Now, body, you recover. If there was anything damaged by this, I speak the life of God, the quickening power, and I'll just speak resurrection life through my body. And then based on the prayer in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 6, where, you know, what people call the Lord's Prayer, you start with our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You start off praising God, and then you end with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. After I've taken my authority and rebuked it, and I've cursed the sickness and I've spoken life to my body, then I'll just end it up with praise and thank you, Father, that this is done, that my body is recovering and, and that's the way that I deal with things. And you know what? I can't say that I do everything perfectly, but I am walking in health more than the vast majority of people are. In 41 years, I've been sick once and it was my own fault when I just totally depleted myself and did too much and stuff. But you know what? I've walked in supernatural health. I've seen broken bones healed in myself. I've seen the itch go. I've seen pains leave. I've seen miraculous things. And a lot of the things I don't even know what happened because I don't go to the doctor and get them to speak death over me and find out what's wrong. I just, whatever it is, I know that I have the power and the authority to change it. See, this is what I'm talking about, that when God provided such a great salvation for us, it put responsibility. With authority comes responsibility. And basically, most of the body of Christ is shirking our responsibility, either out of ignorance or out of just a desire to uh, not be held accountable. We want it to be, well, I don't know why God hasn't moved yet. Our society has become masters today at blaming other people and not accepting responsibility. We blame other people. If we're an alcoholic, it's not my fault. I have a genetic disposition. I have this problem. It's my dysfunctional family. It's the government hasn't given me enough money. If I just had this and if I had that, if I had a different mate, if I had a different job, it's always somebody something else. I'm telling you, that approach will keep you the victim. For you to become a victor, you have to accept responsibility and say, I don't care what has been done to me. I've got a choice whether I become bitter or better. And you have to take that responsibility, start exercising your authority. And as a whole, the body of Christ has not been doing that. Let me use this verse out of Acts chapter 1. This is where Jesus called his disciples out unto a mountain, and this is right before he was taken up into heaven. It's after his resurrection. He had been on the earth for 40 days, and he now had his disciples together, and he was just about to be caught up into the clouds and leave, and he was talking to his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What this is referring to is there's Old Testament scriptures that prophesied that the Messiah would establish a kingdom here on this earth and reign a thousand years. We now know through hindsight and through scripture that there was a period of time, which we're calling the church age, we're living in it now, in between his first coming and his second coming where this physical kingdom would be established. But they didn't understand that, so they were saying, you're about to leave. When are you going to establish this kingdom? They were wanting to know when this was happening. And here's the Lord's answer to him in verse 7. He says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, he's saying, you don't have the power and the authority to know these things. There are some things that I haven't given you. But, in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Lord is saying, You don't have power and authority 
to know all of the times and the seasons. But here's what you do have authority and power over, and that is you are going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. This was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And he says when that happens, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses. And let me just use this to point out that when God gives you power to be a witness and he tells you to go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, Again, that's not just limited to those physical locations, but it's just talking about start where you are. Start right here is Jerusalem, and then Judea would be the outlying areas, and then Samaria is a little bit bigger radius, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, you start where you are, and you just work out. You start with your family. You start with your friends. You start with people at work. You start doing these things. There's no reason for you to go over on the other side of the world and try and reach people when you aren't even reaching the people in your own home, in your own neighborhood, in your own job, and things like this. Start where you are and just work out. But he gave them power to be witnesses. And look at this. In the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, there's an instance where a man named Cornelius, and he wasn't a Jew, he was a Gentile, he was a centurion, so he was a Roman uh, soldier, and he was a godly man, and there appeared unto him an angel and said, Cornelius, your alms are come up before God for a memorial. Send therefore men to Joppa and inquire for Simon. He's in the house of Simon the Tanner, and he will come and tell you the words that you need to be able to be born again. Now think about this. Why didn't the angel just preach to Cornelius and tell him how to get saved? Don't you think the angel understood what it took to be saved? Why to go to all of this effort? It's not as efficient. The angel was already there. Why didn't the angel just tell him? Why did he do all of this? It goes back to what we just read in Romans chapter, I mean in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You now have power and authority to be witnesses unto me. He didn't give that power to angels. He gave it to physical human beings. And angels don't have the power and the authority to preach the gospel. God himself doesn't just come down and miraculously save people. But it's, Paul said it this way. He says, God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. It says over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. That word seed there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 is the word spora. It comes, it's a derivative of the word sperma, and it's talking about just like a sperm has to be planted to see a person born, just like a seed, a spore has to be planted to see a plant grow, the Word of God has to be planted to get people born again. And I'm telling you, this in the body of Christ, again, people just don't apply authority to this. People are praying for their loved ones, and they're saying, oh, God, please save this person. And they plead with them and beg God as if it was just up to God, that God could just snap his fingers and boom, this person would be instantly changed and saved. No, the Bible says people have to witness to them. It's through the foolishness of preaching that they get saved. It says you're born again by the incorruptible seed, by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. What would you think if a person prayed over ground and just prayed and prayed and prayed and wanted tomatoes to come up and no tomatoes ever grew, and so they get mad at God because he hadn't answered their prayer? You can't pray tomatoes into existence. You have to plant seeds. Now, if the seed is planted, you could pray over it and get a greater crop or something, but you have to plant a seed. We would think a person foolish who didn't plant a seed and thought they were going to get tomatoes through prayer. That's not how it works. Well, likewise, it's foolish for a person who prays for a person to be saved but doesn't plant the Word, doesn't recognize that we've got to be witnesses, that it's through the foolishness of preaching that we are born again through the incorruptible seed. And see, the body of Christ is making this mistake constantly. Instead of taking their authority and being a witness, they're just praying. I know people that would never, ever, ever witness to their neighbor to their relatives, to lost people who are at work because somebody might be offended. 
somebody might criticize them and they just couldn't stand with rejection. But they'll get in their closet and they'll pray for hours and hours and hours. Oh, God, save this person. And then they wonder, why isn't this person saved? How come my relatives haven't come to the Lord? Why aren't things working? They won't share the word because they're fearful of being criticized. But they'll pray over them. Let me just say this in love, but I'm saying it as straight as I can. It's useless to do that. That's as useless as praying to get tomatoes without planting a seed. The Lord gave us power and authority, and with that comes responsibility. And you can't shirk that responsibility and not be a witness and just pray that God somehow or another saves them. No, you got to go be a witness. And there are times that may, say maybe a relative or a person will cut you off and they just hate you so much that they aren't going to receive from you. Or possibly they're on the other side of the world and you can't get to them. There may be some instance where you can't physically be the witness, but if that's so, then you should pray Matthew 9, 38, that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest who will preach the word, who will plant the seed and things like that. But just to pray and say, oh, God, save this person without you taking your authority and preaching the gospel or praying that somebody else who has authority preaches the gospel, that's useless. And this is what a large segment of the body of Christ is doing, and it comes down to the fact that they don't understand authority. God gave us power and authority to be a witness. And if we sh aren't a witness, if we don't take that authority, it, we are irresponsible and we will not see the power of God manifest. Same thing is true of healing. He told us to heal the sick. If you don't take your authority and speak to the problem, speak against that sickness, if you spend all of your time praying and asking God to do what he told you to do, it's irresponsible. You aren't going to see that come to pass. It's the same thing with finances. It says in Deuteronomy 8:18, he gave us power to get wealth. And if you're just praying and saying, oh, God, please give me money, instead of saying, Father, thank you that I have power, and now I'm going to set my hand unto something. Give me wisdom, and I take this authority, and I speak that poverty is broken and that blessing has come. See, if you don't take your authority and pray in all of these different areas, it doesn't matter if you're praying for the lost. It doesn't matter if you're praying for revival. It doesn't matter if you're praying for healing. It doesn't matter if you're praying for finances. It doesn't matter if you're praying for deliverance from depression and oppression. You can't just petition God and then sit there and wait on God. No, God's waiting on you to take your authority and power. With power and authority comes responsibility, and you need to take it and exercise it. And I tell you, if you do this, you would see different results. It's my testimony that I have seen totally different results, and I can guarantee you it'll work for you. Now, today's going to be my last day to offer you this teaching entitled, With Authority Comes Responsibility, Part 1. I'm going to still talk about this, but we're going to go into another application of this on our program starting on Monday. And so if you would, would like to get the teaching that I've been talking about, you need to get this. We offer this individual teaching as our free gift to you. We have DVDs, CDs, books, workbooks, all of those things. We ask for a donation of some amount. But today's our last day to offer you this single teaching as our gift to you. The Believer's Authority is available for the very first time in book form. You can receive your copy for seven pounds. Request book T327 when you write or call or when you go to our website. A Spanish version is also available. Request book T735. The Believer's Authority Companion Study Guide is available for £17.50. Request study guide T427 when you contact the ministry. Andrew's complete teaching titled The Believer's Authority was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on DVD for £19. Request DVD album T3205D when you contact us. You can also get Andrew's teaching as seen on TV. It's available on either CD or DVD when you send 19 pounds. Request CD album T1045C or DVD album T1045D when you contact us. The third teaching in the audio CD album titled 
With Authority Comes Responsibility Part 1 is also available for three pounds. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third teaching free of charge. Request teaching TL20 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. Let me just reiterate once again that today is our last day to offer you this single teaching entitled With Authority Comes Responsibility Part 1. Now this is a part of our Believer's Authority set. We have a CD set. There's six teachings in there. This is the third of those six teachings. Today my, is my last day to offer that to you as a free gift. The reason I do this is because sometimes the people who need the teaching the most are the least able to get it. And so because of that, my partners have enabled me and we give away each individual teaching one at a time to those who could not or would not send in an offering. Today's my last day to offer this third teaching in the six-part series on Believer's Authority. You can reach us through our website where you can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. On our website, you'll not only find materials from today's broadcast, you'll find a wealth of resources free for you to download for yourself and share with others. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. This is Andrew Womack, and I'd like to invite you to join me on May the 21st through the 23rd in Amsterdam. I'm going to be speaking at the Euro Spirit 2009, and we're going to have a number of different speakers. I'll be ministering each day the 21st through the 23rd of May. We're going to be holding this at the Victory Outreach in Amsterdam. It's going to be a great time. And so all of you watching over God TV, I'd encourage you to come and be a part of this. May the 21st through the 23rd Victory Outreach in Amsterdam. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. He'll be in Amsterdam for the Eurospirit Conference May 21st through the 23rd, Colorado Springs, Colorado for the annual Summer Family Bible Conference June 29th through July 3rd, and in South Africa for a Gospel Truth Seminar July 21st through the 23rd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. If you just know what God told you to do, then it's not a challenge, it, it's an adventure. I wasn't ready to make a commitment until I really knew that this was God. So we decided that, okay, from this point on, we're not going to speak to each other, we're not going to write, we're not going to be in contact. I gave up marriage and I thought, all right, that's it. I need to read the Bible. I need to find out what, what it says. I need to find out who God is. We could be dropped from a helicopter anywhere on the subcontinent of India, and somehow God was going to direct us. God has given us a plan, and we're seeing people change forever. And it's not just surface, it is in their spirit.